What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec, and we'll be doing the Mirai box from Hack to Box. This box's host name was a big hint, because Mirai was a botnet that was used to denial of service a lot of major sites, such as Brian Krebs' blog, OVH, Dynamic DNS, and the list goes on. The botnet grew because it would just scan the internet for crappy devices with default credentials, mainly IP cameras and routers, but DVRs, printers, etc. on the list of devices it infects. So it would log into the device, then do something to that device to allow it to be a part of their botnet, which then they just use its internet connection to help in the denial of service. So you can bet there's going to be a default credential somewhere on this box, so let's jump in. As always, let's start off with an nmap, so nmap-sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, We'll throw it in the directory nmap and call the file initial and the IP address MRI, which is 10.10.10.48. Already ran it, so let's look at the results. We have three ports open, SSH, DNS, and HTTP. And HTTP, when we go to the page, the title says blocked. So let's check that out. 10.10.10.48. And we don't get anything. That's a little bit odd because we're getting a blocked from Nmap and not when we browse to it. So let's do a curl dash VVV for super verbose 10101048. And we still don't see website blocked anywhere. And we could also throw that into burp. So we turn intercept on, go to the page. Send this to repeater. Not found. However, if we played with this host flag, because Edmap does set the host flag, I forget what it sets it to. You can always run it and do a peek, uh, Wireshark and see what it does. But if we click go, now we get the website blocked. So we have to have something in this host flag for the website to be blocked. And interesting enough, once it's blocked, it exposes a DNS name, pi.hole. So let's do a dig query against that, which is just essentially NS lookup, but I'm doing it because we see it's open on DNS. So we should be able to query information about it. So if we do dig at 10.10.10.48, this is specifying the server, and then put pi.hole. We do get a result to 192.168.204.129. Don't know what that IP is, but if we set this host flag to pi.hole, saying, hey, we want to go to this web page, the web page is called pi.hole, we get a 301 moved and we get directed to admin. So we can test that out. and then pi.hole. So now my computer resolves pi.hole to 10.10.10.48. So if we go to pi.hole, proxy, let's see, this one I can drop. Here we go. Forward. We can just turn intercept off but we get to this administration page. So we know there's something with DNS. There's one thing I wanted to test because if we looked at the Nmap, DNS is listening on TCP. And normally when DNS listens on TCP, that's to facilitate zone transfers. So I want to test a few zone transfers with that. So we can do a dig at AXFR at 10.10.10.48, because we're specifying use this DNS server. And then we're gonna to try to transfer whole. Doesn't look like we get anything. And then we'll do pi.hole, no, HTB, nope. So it doesn't look like zone transfers are enabled. So 
Going back to this, we can try logging in and try default credentials because, again, Morai. And we get wrong password everything we try, so nothing's there. If you looked into the code on GitHub, I believe it automatically it sets a random password and doesn't have a default password. It's random, you log in with it, it tells you to change it. So the one hint, though, is Pi. It's a Raspberry Pi device, apparently. So if you took that piece of information and we use the Raspberry Pi's default credentials, which is username Pi at 10101010.48, and the password is Raspberry, like that, we log in. So if we look around, we have the desktop and that user.txt. Plex is also installed. There's a bunch of things. If we do a sudo-l, we see that the Pi user may run all commands as root. So just sudo su dash, and we get as root. The issue with that, though, is the root.txt is not there. It says, hey, I think I may have a backup of the file on my USB stick. So I did a df-lh to show disks free on everything. I could have also done like the mount command and mount would have told me. So the df, we have dev sdb, dev sdb with mount, however you want to do it. It's mounted read only, but we can go to it. So slash media USB stick. And there's a file that doesn't have the key either because he accidentally deleted it. If we go to the lost and found directory, nothing there. Yeah, so it's a directory completely empty. There is one way to recover the file, though, because Linux, we can just cat this device. Or not cat it, but grep it. If we did strings on dev sdb, you can see something that looks like a flag. And in this case, it is a flag. But this works because you're just catting the block device, the hard drive, and reading the bits off of it. If you did XXD as a hex editor, we can see that has a lot of zeros because that hasn't been written to. And eventually, we're going to get where we have data on this device. And we must have just missed it. So let's grep dash V, and we'll say don't show me anything with a line full of zeros. And we get some results. So we got the text of the file, the hash, and then random stuff, some all Fs. File names on that, so we can see root.txt does exist. Or it didn't even delete the file name. But, yeah. So... How I got the flag is I didn't use strings. I, when dealing with these block devices, I tried to do an actual file recovery, so I used grep. And I said, hey, let's grep for a regular expression. Any lowercase character, because that's what we're looking for. And then I also want to say numbers can be included. And then for 32 straight times, because... There's not really many 32 characters straight that match that. Even this text has capital spaces, special characters. So the only thing that should match should be this. So we're going to grep that on dev sdb. Binary file matches because I forgot the dash a flag to treat binary files as text. And we get that. And why do I like using grep instead of strings? Because you can do things like show me the two lines before and the two lines after that. And recover entire files. So strings is nice if you're just doing the CTF, but if you actually wanted to recover a file off a block device and you didn't have bin walk or something, this would be a good way to go. So we could do, let's say... We know a piece of the file we deleted off the USB. 
So if we grep that, we only get that line. We could do dash b2, dash a2, and start recovering the entire thing. So if we do a5, because right here we know this isn't part of the file. That doesn't look like text. We're looking for text. So dash a5, and we get the entire file. So that's why I like grep. Since I mentioned bin walk earlier, let's actually do a bin walk and see if it will find the file or do anything. So let's do it on my host computer. Before I do that, I want to see if dd exists. dd does. I want to see if dcfldd exists, which is just a more forensic version of dd. So I'm going to use that one because it exists and we're doing some type of forensics. Exit one more to get back to my host. And we can do ssh pi at 10, 10, 10, 48. I'm going to run the command sudo dcfldd if equals dev sdb. I'm going to pipe that to gzip dash one. And that's just going to zip the information on the fly. And I'm doing that just because we're doing it remotely and I wanted to zip it to make it faster. And zipping has a good compression ratio on hard drives because you saw all those zeros. So it doesn't send all those, it just says, hey, zero times whatever essentially and compresses that. So it's got a pretty good compression rate. And then we can pipe that entire SSH command to uh, dcfldd output file equals pi dot dd.gz. I think that works right. Try it. Pi's password is raspberry. And we already did it. So if we look at du hs on pi, it's only 48k. But that image is 8 or 10 megabytes. So that's the compression rate 48 kilobytes from 8 plus megabytes. So anyways, let's examine this. So we'll do gunzip-d to unzip this. And now we have pi.dd. And I'm in my nmap directory. Let's move this out. So we can now binwalk pi.dd. And we see a Linux ext file system. We can do dash capital ME on pi.dd. And this is going to auto extract. So if we go to pi.dd extracted, go to the root partition, we didn't get the file. So let's try a different thing. Test disk pi.dd. And we have a 10 megabyte partition, so proceed. I know this is ext, I don't see ext here, so I'm just going to select non-partition data. And we can do advanced for file system utilities. Specify the partition. And I thought it would have got this. We can do list maybe. There we go. If I do list, I can see a deleted file root.txt and C to copy current file and then capital C when destination is correct. This tool is a bit funky how it tells you what to do in different spots. But we copied the file and we can see if it saved it. Again, when I was saying that, the output was down here. So it was on superblock by default, and that's why it only said ext. So I moved it to list. But Q to quit out, do it a few times, and we got the root.txt file, and it didn't get the contents. So I'm just going to do photo rec. It's another tool. Uh, proceed. Search ext we'll do unallocated first and capital C to 
output this. Zero file saved, so it didn't recover anything. Do it from the whole partition. One file saved in that one. So recrypto one, nothing there. It's just a report.xml that will say no files. And we got one file. And not the file we want. That's just the file that exists. So it's a, showing you that the forensic tools do fail you, and there's still benefit to doing, like, examining it in a hex editor. We did see that root.txt existed through the um, deleted file tool. So at that point, that's when you should just open it up in a hex editor and examine the file and see if you can get any contents. So that is that. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Take care, and I'll see you next week.